Tonight at 10, we are live in the Ukrainian capital, Kyiv, where Boris Johnson has been meeting President Zelensky. In what number 10 is calling a show of solidarity, Boris Johnson offered Ukraine more military hardware and financial support for the war with Russia. The UK and others supply the equipment, the technology, the, the know-how, the intelligence, so that Ukraine will never be invaded again. I'm grateful to the United Kingdom that continues and intensifies the sanctions and also provides significant support to Ukraine by reinforcing our defence capacities. Also in the programme tonight, in Pakistan, Prime Minister Imran Khan is ousted from power in a vote of no confidence. What a way to go out! Sam Whaley Cohen and Noble Yates for Aaron Mullins won the national! An amateur jockey riding in the final race of his career on his father's horse wins the Grand National. Good evening. We are live in Kyiv, where in the last few hours, Boris Johnson held face-to-face -face talks with Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky. During the meeting, he praised what he called the president's resolute leadership and the invincible heroism of the Ukrainian people. He also set out a new package of financial and military aid, including an offer of 120 armoured vehicles and new anti-ship missile systems for the war with Russia. Mr. Zelensky welcomed the UK's support for his country and urged other Western allies to intensify the pressure on Moscow. Our Europe correspondent, Mark Lowen, has this report now on today's talks. How are you? How are you? Little time for the niceties when you're a leader at war. Volodymyr Zelensky hosting Boris Johnson today, pressing the flesh of a key Western backer. You're looking well. Yes. Unbelievable yes, considering what you've been through. You are strong. <laughs> the strength of the underdog, Ukraine's president battling for his country's survival, welcoming and pleading with the outside world to help fight Russian aggression. <laughs> the unannounced talks came as Britain pledged 120 armoured vehicles and new anti-ship missile systems. My God. The two men were keen to suggest Ukraine is on the front foot, a walkabout in Kyiv inconceivable a fortnight ago. Boris Johnson basking in praise for his support from the public and the president. We have to exert pressure in the form of sanctions, and I'm grateful to the United Kingdom that continues and intensifies the sanctions and also provide significant support to Ukraine by reinforcing our defence capacities. The other democratic Western countries should follow the example of the United Kingdom. From Boris Johnson arriving as horrors are unearthed from neighbouring towns, warm words for a leader he called a lion. I thank you for what you've been able to do. I think your leadership has been extraordinary. And I think in what Putin has done in places like Bucha and in Irpin, uh, his war crimes have permanently polluted his reputation and the reputation of his, of his government. Boris Johnson was long keen to come here to Kyiv, but was waiting for the security situation to stabilise following the withdrawal of Russian troops from the area. And while this city has calmed, the renewed Russian offensive in the east has made Ukraine push even harder for more military aid. Russian tanks pushed on today as a governor in the east urged civilians to flee immediately, warning of troops massing nearby. Bucha near Kiev, now free of Russian troops, shows what might lie in store elsewhere. 360 people are said to have died here and Ukraine, the David against the Goliath, is still crying out for help. Mark Lowen, BBC News, Kiev. Well, as you just heard there, the meeting today comes as civilians in eastern Ukraine have been told to leave the area urgently because Russian forces may be planning a mass assault. Yesterday, two missiles hit a train station in the city of Kramatorsk, killing more than 50 people trying to escape fighting in the region. At least four of the dead are children.
Our defence correspondent Jonathan Beale has sent us this report from Kramatorsk and a warning it contains some images you may find distressing. They were supposed to be taking a train to safety, but instead they were leaving Kramatorsk by ambulance. Most of the severely injured in yesterday's missile attack had already been taken west to larger hospitals. These, the walking wounded, still needing surgery to remove the pieces of shrapnel from their bodies and still clearly traumatized. I heard a lot of explosions and I fell down. When I got up, a lot of people were already dead. It was only me who stood up from the floor. It's a wonder. God saved me. I have a penetrating chest injury from one side and my legs are wounded, like everywhere. I got the shrapnel into my groin, into my artery. I fainted twice, lost a lot of blood. Medical staff worked day and night to save the lives of the dozens injured. Not all made it. Six died before they had a chance to operate, including a young child. There were life-threatening injuries, amputations, torn limbs, torn feet, stomach wounds and brain injuries. Those were the severe cases. It's surreal what's happened. It just can't be explained. I can't imagine what kind of person takes the decision to launch a missile into a place where civilians are gathering. These were the chaotic scenes after the strike. Thousands had gathered at Kremator station, hoping to get a train to safety. Many of them women and children. They were among the dozens of bodies lying on the ground. Alexei was still looking through the wreckage this morning. Normally, he helps recover the bodies of Ukrainian troops killed in battle. But yesterday, he was having to gather the remains of unarmed civilians, the innocence of this war. When you see our future being killed, the future of Ukraine, you can't control your emotions. You understand this is genocide, and they're killing us just because we're Ukrainian. And you can see that when you look at the bodies of the women and children. Investigators were still examining the remains of a missile nearby. Eyewitnesses say they saw multiple explosions, raising the possibility that it may have contained cluster munitions. It's still not clear what exactly happened here, whether this missile might have been shot down, and that's why some of it's still intact. But the state railway company says that a number of missiles were fired at the railway station. And despite Russia's denials of responsibility, people here think it was a deliberate attack. Jonathan Beale, BBC News, Kramatorsk. More heartbreaking testimony from this pitiless war. Well, Boris Johnson's trip here comes a day after the European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen made the same journey to Kyiv. The leaders of Poland, the Czech Republic and Slovenia have also been here in the last few weeks. The visits are a major sign of confidence, not just in President Zelensky and his wartime leadership, but also in Ukraine itself, that it's managing to weather the Russian storm and is in control of its own capital. But no one is under any illusions about the next few weeks, possibly months. The battles on the Eastern Front will be harder, less urban, fought across more flat, open land, perfect for heavy Russian armor. It is in the East where this war could be won. That's it from me and the team here in Kyiv. Now back to you, Martin, in the studio for the rest of the day's news. Clive, thank you. The Prime Minister of Pakistan, Imran Khan, has been dismissed from office after losing a vote of no confidence. The country's parliament finally held the ballot tonight after the ruling party delayed it for 13 hours. Our Pakistan correspondent Sukunda Kamani is following events in Islamabad. Sukunda, what's the reaction been? Well, it's been a day and night of intense political drama. It's past 2 a.m. here and parliament is still in session of opposition supporters or supporters of what used to be the opposition are celebrating behind me. You can perhaps hear them. But for a while today, it looked as if this vote of no confidence against Imran Khan would not take place, as if his party would block it for a second time despite a Supreme Court order. But after a day of 
delays in parliament, meandering speeches by Imran Khan's allies. Uh, shortly before midnight, MPs from Imran Khan's party walked out of parliament and a new Speaker of the House said that the vote would start. The result was a foregone conclusion because a number of Imran Khan's coalition allies had publicly deserted him, giving the opposition the majority in parliament. They'll now be able to select their own candidate as prime minister. That should happen in the next few days, by Monday most likely. But this new government will face real challenges, not in the least from Imran Khan himself, because he's still insisting he's the victim of an international conspiracy orchestrated by the United States, targeting him, he says, because of his foreign policy decisions, including a recent trip to Moscow. Now, most analysts uh, don't believe that. American officials and his political opponents have dismissed the allegation, but it is resonating with his voters. And Imran Khan has called on his supporters to come out and conduct peaceful protests on Sunday evening. Sukunda, thank you very much, Sukunda Kamani in Islamabad. The Chancellor Rishi Sunak has asked senior civil servants to investigate leaks about his wife's tax arrangements. Mr Sunak's wife says she will now pay UK taxes on her overseas income after the political row over her non-domiciled status. Our deputy political editor Vicky Young is here. What difference will it make to find out who leaked it? Well, I think thinking about previous Whitehall leak inquiries, I've that's sort of a lot that get launched. You don't often find out actually uh, who did it. I think it is a sign, though, of how bruised Rishi Sunak feels about all of this. He feels that he and his wife, back in 2018, when he became a minister, declared all sorts of things, actually went beyond what they had to do, uh, they feel, to make sure that he did comply with the ministerial code. But there is no doubt that damage has been uh, done here. And I think it's partly his handling of all of this initially. He did an interview where he dismissed the criticism, said it was nothing more than a smear campaign, of course, now, since it's all come to light, there has, of course, uh, been this U-turn. And I think also there were some who will think he's been a bit naive here to think that this wasn't going to come out and that when it did, there would be criticism. There's some people thinking it's an inappropriate arrangement, even though, of course, it is completely within the law. And I think this takes us to judgment. And his judgment, this is not a new criticism of him. I remember when people were talking about Boris Johnson maybe uh, moving on from the post and whether Rishi Sunak could take over. Quite a lot of people who actually regard him quite highly actually think he doesn't have the political nous to be prime minister. But my hunch is, despite all this trouble it's causing him, what he does as chancellor, whether it's taxation, whether it's uh, about the cost of living crisis, that will dictate his career path probably a little bit more. Vicky, thank you very much. Voting in the French presidential election starts tomorrow. The top two of the 12 candidates will face each other in a final vote in a fortnight. Recent polls show a dramatic fall in President Macron's lead over his main challenger, the far-right leader Marine Le Pen. Our Paris correspondent Lucy Williamson joins us. Lucy, what's behind this shift in the polls? Well, a lot of it seems to be connected to the war in Ukraine, and that seems to have actually helped President Macron less than it's helped his far-right rival Marine Le Pen, despite her links to Russia. To begin with, President Macron only really began campaigning here three weeks ago because he was tied up with the war, he was talking to President Putin. Marine Le Pen has been campaigning for a lot longer than that, and she's been focusing on rising prices. That's something that the war has made even more of an issue here, and it seemed to be a key concern of voters. I have to say, she also read the room really quickly after the invasion and shifted her position on Ukrainian refugees, for example. And that's something her nationalist rival, Eric Zemmour, didn't do. He lost votes and she has picked up some of those. So the polls are now very close indeed, particularly for the first round tomorrow, but also for the runoff in two weeks' time. Of course, we'll have to wait until the votes are counted to really see what France thinks and what, if anything, has changed. Lucy, thank you. All the sports news now with Ollie. Ollie Foster, hello. Many thanks indeed, Martine. The amateur jockey Sam Whaley Cohen in his last race was the toast of Aintree this afternoon as he won the Grand National on the outsider Noble Yates, the horse is owned by his father. It's, it was also a debut win for the Irish trainer Emmett Mullins, although half the field failed to finish the race. Here's our senior sports news reporter, Laura Scott. <laughs> Just two days ago, he announced he'd be retiring, the Grand National his farewell ride, and it proved the sweetest of swan songs for jockey Sam Whaley Cohen. Fans had waited three long years to be back at Aintree, and 70,000 of them arrived full of anticipation, some clearly keen to stand out from the crowd. 
this the moment they were here for. And they're off and racing. But it wasn't long before one of the favourites, last year's winner, Rachel Blackmore, and her horse, Manella Times, were down at the ninth fence. And it looks as though Manella Times has gone. Manella Times. After the last of 29 fences, the favourite, any second now, took the lead. But in orange, Sam Whaley Cohen, the only amateur jockey in the race, had other ideas on 50 to one shot Noble Yates, coming out on top following a thrilling duel to the line. What a way to go out! You just can't make it up, can you? I mean, like, you try and give everybody joy and happiness and, and something to celebrate, and mostly everyone goes home thinking, what, what a waste of time. So for it to come off and to make it all happen like that was just uh, surreal. 15 of the 40 horses finished the race with one fatality, Discarama put down after an injury. And it later emerged that Whaley Cohen had been handed a penalty for breaching whip rules during his winning ride. A sting in the tail then to what had otherwise been such a memorable day. The Grand National so often provides memorable moments and it delivered once again. Laura Scott, BBC News, Aintree. Today's Premier League goals are coming up after the news. Stay right there, though, if you want the results. Everton have boosted their chances of staying up and also dented Manchester United's hopes of a top-four finish. Anthony Gordon scored the only goal of the game. They won 1-0 at Goodison Park. United stay seventh. Everton now four points clear of the relegation zone. Arsenal lost 2-1 at home to Brighton. Chelsea put six past Southampton. Leeds move towards safety with victory at Watford and Tottenham are three points clear in fourth. Son Heung-min scored a hat-trick in their 4-0 win at Aston Villa. With Rangers playing tomorrow, Celtic are nine points clear at the top of the Scottish Premiership. They beat St Johnston 7-0 at Celtic Park. Matt O'Reilly came off the bench and scored twice in the second half. Also, two big derbies today in Scotland finished all square between Dundee United and Dundee and Hearts beat Hibs 3-1. All the details of today's football are on the BBC Sport website. England are five points clear at the top of the women's Six Nations table after thrashing Wales 58 points to five at Kingsholm. They ran in ten tries in front of a record crowd for their third bonus point victory of the campaign. The Challenge Cup holders St Helens, they coasted to a 36-20 victory against Catalan Dragons to reach the semi-finals. And for the first time in 10 years, Huddersfield Giants are into the semis. They beat Hull FC 24-16. Man of the match, Tui Lolohea, ran the show, scoring a try and kicking six goals. Lewis Hamilton says the problems with his Mercedes are so bad that he's not enjoying driving it. He's going to start from fifth in tomorrow's Australian Grand Prix. Qualifying was far from straightforward, with a number of crashes causing delays on the Melbourne street circuit. But that didn't hinder the championship leader, Charles Leclerc, who claimed his, seventh, his second pole of the season for Ferrari. Uh, there's more on that on the BBC Sport website and also the latest from the third round of the Masters that's well underway. The world number one, Scotty Scheffler, is still five shots clear of the field. But that's all the sport for now. Ollie, thank you very much. You can see more on all of today's stories on the BBC News Channel. That's all from me. Good night. <laughs>